Hey, St. Paul. This is Pastor Aaron. I miss all of you guys. I wish we could be in worship. I miss worship already. But we're just going to have to make the best of this coronavirus situation. And until this is all over, we will make sure, I will make sure that we continue to provide resources like this for you and your family so that you can continue to honor the Sabbath day and gather together as the scriptures urge us and command us to do and worship our God. Uh, So that's what I want you guys to do this weekend. Get your family together. Use this video. I emailed out a brief outline for worship uh, earlier this week, and it doesn't have to be anything complicated, just an invocation, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Do some kind of confession absolution. I I attached an example to the email that I sent out. Uh, Use your hymnal for more examples. But basically, it's just an opportunity for everyone to confess their sin, Uh, Maybe something specific, you could go around the room, or maybe it's a time for people to reconcile if brothers and sisters have been fighting a lot in the house, or or, um, maybe you, mom and dad, um, could take the opportunity to to reconcile, to confess, and to forgive. And then, of course, heads of household, dad, that's probably you. Uh, Make sure you announce to the family, just like I do on Sunday morning, that indeed, our sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Uh, because of all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Sing hymns together, um, play this sermon, uh, read the scriptures associated with it, and then spend some time in prayer. Uh, Families can pray for their own situation, the community, the nation, and then give the blessing. You know the blessing. We say it every Sunday. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Well, a few things before we get started. I am going to, like I said, be posting these each week, probably on Fridays or Saturdays, and that way they're available for you for weekend worship. Um, I do want to give a little shout out right quick to one of our trustees, Eddie Klecker. He was really awesome and helped make something available uh, that makes me feel like I'm in some kind of professional studio. This awesome microphone, another cool. Um, so thank you, Eddie. Uh, I hope it makes our experience uh, a great one together. So here we are, the Sunday morning sermon then for March 22nd. Uh, the scripture readings for our message today come from the book of Exodus and the Gospel of Mark. And you're probably going to laugh at my low-tech way of showing you these scriptures. I'll probably get some emails telling me all kinds of ways to do this more professionally, but I think it works great Here they are, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, and Mark 15, verses 21 to 32. And I'm just going to hold those up there. You pause the video right quick, and you can read those together with your family. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The title of the sermon today is God's Grace for Grumblers which you yeah, maybe already probably kind of figured out what the sermon was going to be about based on that Old Testament text. It's about grumbling, complaining, whining, belly aching. Uh, we call it all kinds of things. Usually as parents, right, we come down on our kids for it. Um, when they complain, we, we fuss at them. We, we tell them that it's not a godly behavior. But let's be honest, we are all whiners and complainers, aren't we? We're, we're so easily prone to being negative at a, on a constant basis. It's a habitual thing, a f- part of the fabric of our lives, it seems like, even from an early age. I mean, I know I get on the road and somebody's driving too slow in front of me, and not only do I complain about it, but then it kind of makes me negative about other things, too. We're at the restaurant, and the food isn't coming exactly when we think it should. Uh, you know how it is when our tummy rumbles, uh, our mouths start to grumble. Um, and, and then all of a sudden the whole experience is ruined because we're negative, we're whining, we're complaining. Uh, we complain when it doesn't rain enough. Boy, do we complain about that. But then as soon as it starts raining, a lot of times we complain that it's raining too much. Why do we complain so much? Why are we so easily prone to grumbling all the time? Well, as we read our Old Testament text today, we see that We're not alone in that. God's people, uh, I I can't prove this, but who knows? Maybe Christians are even the worst about it. 
Maybe we get so used to having God's grace and knowing that he's in heaven watching over us that the moment something doesn't go the, the, exactly the way we want it to, maybe we're more prone to, to belly aching and complaining and being negative. And boy, that cannot, that cannot give a good witness uh, to Jesus Christ, right? There's no way our light can shine when we're complaining all the time. And so today we see God's people caught up in the midst of this. And it is a bad habit that the children of Israel had. Uh, we read from Exodus 17, but if you read Exodus chapter 16, uh, you'll see that the, the habit had already started long before. Um, the context here is right after God has delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. Remember, he sends the ten plagues upon Pharaoh in Egypt, humbles this mighty nation of the earth at the time, and then leads his people through the Red Sea onto dr on dry ground. Um, when Pharaoh's army tries to follow, the, the waves of the Red Sea come crashing down on top of them, destroying them. I mean, just imagine, imagine seeing God hand salvation to you like that on a silver platter. You think it would, it would change you forever. You would think that you'd never complain about another thing after witnessing God doing that for you. And yet, here we are one month later now uh, in the book of Exodus, and all Israel is doing is, is complaining about the daily the daily frustrations. In chapter 16, it's, it's bread. They don't have enough to eat, and they grumble and grumble and grumble. In fact, the word grumble is used eight times in Exodus chapter 16. And so what does God do? He sends them manna from heaven. They walk out their tents in the morning, and there it is, just ready to pick up. Hand, uh, you know, delivered, better than Amazon. But then in Exodus chapter 17, just a short time later, they run out of water. And, and once again, not only are they complaining, but they're quarreling, quarreling with Moses, um, quarreling with God because they don't have enough water. And, you know, it, it's funny, too, how their complaints are phrased. It's not just, hey, God, we need water, we need water, but but they actually start griping about the things that God has already done for them. All that wonderful salvation handed to them on that silver platter. They start complaining about that too. In chapter 16, they say this, If only we had died. If only we had died in Egypt. There we got to sit around meat pots and we got to eat any food we wanted. But now you've brought us out into this desert to starve. And of course... In our text today, they complained to God that he brought them out of Egypt to kill them, right? God intended to bring them out in the desert so they could die of thirst. Now, here's the thing. I think the real problem here is a perception problem. I mean, usually our complaining, that's the problem. It's perception. The way we're looking back at the past. You know, here Israel was coming from a past of forced labor, slavery. Many of them were probably still healing from the, the wounds uh, that were created by whips. Um, you know, still recovering from, from this awful ordeal. A place where their, their baby boys had been thrown in the Nile River as a means of population control. I mean, things were atrocious in Egypt for Israel. But all of a sudden, they're seeing those days as the good old days. That's a problem, a perception problem, something along the lines of selective amnesia. Now, let's not get too, you know, high and mighty here, because you know what? I think we experience this problem all the time, too, selective amnesia. Uh, I see it in marriage and married couples all the time. You know what I'm talking about, husbands and wives. You have this tendency to sort of selectively forget the past. And, and so when we get irritated with our spouse, what are the things that come out of our mouth? We say things like, oh, you always, or you never, or I always, you know, I never. And then we state our complaint about the other person. Always? Never? Really? Selective amnesia. Well, you know, someone once said, when it comes to perception, that we can either complain because a rose bush bears thorns, or we can rejoice because a thorn bush bears roses. All depends on how you look at things. And, well, you know, I think that's what grumbling does to us. It, it distorts the, the perception of facts. Even though there's more than enough good things going on in our day, grumbling kind of forces us to only focus on the negative. I mean, think about it. Here at St. Paul, or at St. Paul, we, we start worship almost every Sunday by saying together, 
You know, I start by saying, this is the day the Lord has made, and everyone else responds, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made, and so we should rejoice and be glad in it. God's made every day for that very purpose. And yet, how often do we roll out of bed in a bad mood, and that mood tends to dictate the way we see everything that happens that day and every conversation we have. So much good, so much opportunity to, to be God's people. So much opportunity to enjoy his creation and enjoy the day he's made, but we let our mood, we let our perception dictate and distort the way we're going to respond to this beautiful day that the Lord has made. I guess maybe at the end of the end of the day, our grumbling is sort of a way whereby we look heavenward and we say, hey God, what have you done for me lately? I don't care what you did for me this morning. I don't care what you did for me an hour ago. I don't care all the ways that you've walked with me through life, through those dark valleys, with your rod and your staff comforting me. I want to know what have you done for me lately? We may not say it that way directly to God, but boy, at the very least, our grumbling sure has to show that we don't trust God. You know, Sunday after Sunday, we we come to church, or we come to this video, and we get to hear about God's grace given us on the cross. In worship, we receive the very forgiveness of Christ himself, confession, absolution. The forgiveness is announced, proclaimed to us, given to us. And then we get to go out the church doors and we get to engage in all kinds of wonderful things. And yet how often do we go out those doors and immediately that selective amnesia just sort of takes hold and we forget the miraculous things God has done for us in worship. And instead we, well, our lives get saturated with dissatisfaction and we become chronic complainers. Are you tired of that? You tired of feeling unsatisfied? Are you tired of that spiritual dryness that comes when, when all we can ever do is see the negative and, and whine and complain? Are you tired of finding yourself complaining over what God should have given you? How do we get from grumbling to gladness? Well, I guess I could just command you to stop <laughs> as your pastor, although that probably doesn't come across very well via video for sure, but... But really, what good would that do anyway? It wouldn't work. Um, it never works with my kids. But you know, for some reason, no matter how much they might complain, the funny thing is, I keep loving them anyway, right? I keep doing what's best for them. And maybe that's the beautiful mystery of our relationship with God, too. God responds the same way toward us. I don't know why, <laughs> why he would but he does towards all of us. What does God do for the children of Israel in our text? When he could have struck them down or just walked away from them for their, their miserable complaining, no, instead he gives them the very things they need, the very things they want. When he should have you know, given them a good spanking, <laughs> instead he blesses them. God is a God of incredible blessings. God's response for grumblers is grace. In our gospel lesson today, we see Jesus doing the hard work of accomplishing our salvation, dying on the cross, bearing the sins of all the world, enduring hell itself. Indeed, that old gospel song, Amazing Grace, says it well, how sweet the sound you know, to hear those words, to hear of what our, our Lord has done for us in this season of Lent. God never lets our ingratitude stand in the way of Him sending His Son to us. Not just 2,000 years ago, but today through His Word. Today through our worship together. Jesus doesn't let our constant discontent with each and every day keep Him from the cross. Indeed, it's why He went there in the first place. Yet, isn't it funny, like a little child who can't even make themselves a sandwich. You know, when mom sets the sandwich in front of them on the table, what do they tend to complain about and whine about? Oh, she didn't cut the crusts off just right, or cut it into perfect triangles. Oh yeah, we're just like that sometimes. God, he's given us salvation on a silver platter, 
right there. We look to the cross and we see it all spelled out in Jesus' blood. And yet we can so easily forget the joy in the grace that has been shown to us by God who loves us so completely. Well, today I want you to know that you are forgiven for your sins, forgiven for all of your complaining, your whining, your belly aching, for your negative attitude. And you and I, we do. We need to stop complaining when life isn't just so. And yeah, I know, there's a lot of things that aren't just so right now. (laughs) Some of us may not even have enough toilet paper, okay? There may be a lot of things in your life right now that you think warrant complaining and whining. And yes, we can try to curb our grumbling behavior as best we can, which is good and right and so to do. But... God doesn't just simply show us how to stop grumbling. No, for the benefit of grumbling people like you and me, Jesus says, it is finished. On the cross, he said, it is finished. He has accomplished salvation. He's given you and I what we need most. Even if death itself should come to us today, what have you and I to fear? And so may the grace of God satisfy you and give you joy on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, one more thing. Don't forget, you can catch this sermon and others every Sunday morning on the radio. A KMIL out of Cameron, and that's at 7.30 on Sunday mornings. KRXT out of Rockdale at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And then out of Austin on AM 1120, The Bridge, at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings. Uh, Also, check out YouTube. Go to the search bar on YouTube and just put in St. Paul Lutheran Sound, and there you'll find a whole inventory of old sermons, two and a half years worth. I don't know how great they are. Video may be, you know, video is good. Sound may be bad. I don't know. Um, Check it out, though. Another opportunity to get God's Word. A big thank you to everyone who helps make this possible at St. Paul in Thorndale, uh, Stephen Leatherwood, our sound guy, and a whole host of others, our elders and others. Uh, Teresa Ging, thank you so much. And we'll see you back next week.